We will be joined shortly by the Guillen family, and I will introduce them um, later in the program. Uh, a special thanks to Maya and Lupe, uh, who have been staunch advocates for taking cases of sexual assault and sexual harassment out of the chain of command. Uh, a special thank you to Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who met with the Guillen family last year and vowed that they would be a vote on the Vanessa Guillen Act uh, in the House. And um, she has been steadfast in her support. Uh, to my co-lead uh, on the Senate side, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, who has shown extraordinary leadership and a um, steadfast and tenacious commitment to this issue uh, for eight years. I want to thank the House co-leads, Mike Turner, Anthony Brown, Marion Miller-Meeks, Elaine Luria, Trent Kelly, Veronica Escobar, Mark Wayne Mullen, and Sylvia Garcia. Today we announce the bicameral, bipartisan, Vanessa Guillen Military Justice Improvement and Increasing Prevention Act. Today we are announcing that um, the time has come. We're here today because each year 20,000 service members are sexually assaulted and another 100,000 are sexually harassed. We're here today because only one third of those sexually assaulted feel comfortable reporting it for fear of retaliation and only 1% of those sexually harassed feel comfortable reporting. We're here today for the service members who have spoken out or who have suffered in silence because the message and culture in the military has been clear. Shut up, suck it up, and don't rock the boat. The UCMJ is a creation of Congress. We have the right and the responsibility to amend it when it fails to deliver justice. And that's why we are here today. Senator Gillibrand and I have dedicated the better part of 10 years to right this wrong. I first authored legislation on this topic on November 11, 2011, 10 years ago. The proposal was dismissed and attacked, as was I. But the voices of the victims and the survivors could no longer be silenced. The heinous murder of Vanessa Guillen, specialist Vanessa Guillen, was the tipping point. Senator Gillibrand and I and our co-leads come together today with one voice and one plan to save service members from the fates of Specialist Guillen, Private First Class Asia Graham, Airman First Class Natasha Apashian, and so many others like them. The tragedy is that it took their brutal killings, their deaths, to wake Congress and the military up. When I, when I retrace Specialist Guillen's footsteps to the arms room last summer, I vowed then and there that her life would not be in vain. I went to the base to find out what had gone so terribly wrong, that Specialist Guillen and so many other soldiers had lost their lives. Since 2016, more Fort Hood soldiers have died in homicides than in battle. Think about that. More homicides in the, the actual installation than in battle, making their homeland more deadly than the battlefield. But Fort Hood is far from alone. Private First Class Asia Graham was just 19 years old when she died of an overdose at Fort Bliss. She was sexually assaulted by another soldier while she was unconscious, and for a year, there was no justice, just isolation and ostracism. Subsequently, her assailant was tried for multiple sexual assaults, multiple sexual assaults. Airman First Class Natasha Pashian at Grand Forks Air Force Base told her parents she was afraid of a fellow airman the day she ended their two-week relationship. He would hear none of it. So he killed her and then turned the gun on himself. After her murder, another airman came forward and said Apashian's killer had sexually assaulted her in tech school at another installation. 
Following Specialist Guillen's death, the angry cries of thousands of service members rang out with, I am Vanessa Guillen. Hashtag, I am Vanessa Guillen on social media. Vanessa's family demanded answers and change, and they have the change so that Vanessa's tragic short life, one she wanted to dedicate to the service of her country, will live on in the spirit of justice for others. Their strong, unified voice have been heard. Today, we have a broad bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate to make a fundamental and critical change to the military justice system, to take sexual assault cases and other major non-military felony crimes out of the chain of command, and empower independent and trained military attorneys to make the crucial decision of whether to try a service member for such crimes. It's essential because it avoids the perception and the reality of a conflict of interest, especially when the victim and the perpetrator report up the same chain of command. It offers survivors and their families the independence and professionalization they have been asking for. And finally, more survivors will have confidence to make a report so that the military holds those who prey on fellow service members accountable. This is not the end of the road, it's a new beginning. With 66 co-sponsors in the Senate and a broad bipartisan support in the House, we will pass this bill this year. The haunting words of one soldier ring in my ears still today. She told me she was prepared and trained to fight the enemy outside the wire, but never thought the enemy would be a fellow soldier. With that, I'd like to introduce the Speaker of the House, uh, my great friend, the great advocate for this legislation, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Speer, for your very strong statement in terms of this legislation. I'm honored to be here with you and sponsor in the Senate, Senator Gillibrand. She has had me very well versed on uh, her, her path to this. I know you will hear that next. Uh, we have a House Democratic Caucus that I have to go to now, but what an honor it is to be with each and every one of you. Thank you uh, for making this so strongly bipartisan because it is so strongly patriotic. It's an honor to be here with Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate, who uh, support this legislation, some here, uh, some uh, on the record. Let me just say why I, th why I personally am here. I met with the Guillen family, Vanessa and Myra, their mom, uh, and, and just the whole family is so patriotic. And Vanessa, this lovely young woman, so patriotic, wanted to serve our country. It wasn't a job for her, it was a patriotic joy. And then it turned into this. But hearing her story, I was reminded, and, and I didn't need much reminder, but I was reminded of all of the women that I had met in theater. I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan many times, been on, uh, to their camps and the rest, Listen to the stories of women, mostly women, not always women, mostly women's stories who have been victimized in this manner. I've listened with them, with the chaplains, with healthcare professionals and the rest. This is a problem, a challenge. It isn't a, just a, an incident of someone's interpretation of a conversation. This is a challenge that we have. It is long overdue that it is addressed. It must be addressed. The public visibility of it is necessary to make sure that it happens. The bipartisanship of it, so, so very eloquent in recognizing the need to get the job done. And again, I thank Senator Gillibrand for her courageous leadership in the Senate on this for over a long period of time. And Jackie Speer, as we know, in the House has been relentless every single day in every possible venue, including going right uh, to the camp, uh, as she has indicated. So I thank all of you for your leadership, your courage, your patriotism uh, to, again, help us honor our oath of office to protect and defend. But as we protect and defend the Constitution and the American people, that we protect those who protect us as well. Uh, so I'm very... Uh, uh, Definite. We will bring this bill to the floor. It will pass in the House. I hope that it will uh, succeed in the Senate as as well. 
and that will be do so soon. But say her name, Vanessa Guillen, her family, so courageous, turning their grief into change to save other people who might be victimized. And again, it's important not to just talk about harassment, but to talk about other crimes that flow from it. So thank you for your leadership, your, your courage, all of you. And onward to uh, bring you to the floor as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, now my co-lead, I'm pleased to introduce Congressman Mike Turner. Thank you, Jackie. Um, thank you for your passion on this incredibly important issue. Today we do what all of America calls for and wants. This is a bipartisan press conference, bicameral press conference, on a bipartisan and bicameral solution uh, to a tragedy uh, that we see all too frequently uh, in our military that affects our men and women in uniform. It's not about one of us, it's about all of us because this, these are the voices throughout the Senate and the House that have come together to be able to support a piece of legislation that responds to both the concerns and the needs of addressing the very violent crime, which is one of the most horrible uh, violations of human rights of sexual assault. I want to congratulate Senator Gildebrand, who's been the convener. Uh, Senator Gildebrand has listened. Uh, she has done what everybody asks for in Washington, and that is someone who will sit down, listen to each and every person who has had um, this as their cause and has worked on this issue, addressed the concerns uh, that were echoed throughout the House and the Senate, to bring forth a piece of legislation that both technically addresses the issue that is so technically important because it's, it's talking about the military justice system, but also rising to the level of understanding the human impact, the human concerns of what happens to our men and women in uniform as a result of sexual assault. <clears throat> when we have a system that fails victims, everyone is failed because everyone is a potential victim. When everyone goes to work every day and believes that they are in a system that could permit them to be a victim of sexual assault and not be responsive. We have failed them. In my own community, just prior to 2007, Maria Lauterbach, a Marine, was sexually assaulted on base. She reported it to her commanders and requested a transfer. Her transfer was denied. Um, she uh, subsequently reported a pregnancy from that rape. Uh, the commanders decided to inform the accused and to tell him that upon the birth of the child, they would do a DNA test and determining the outcomes of that, they would then go forward to prosecute. In her eighth month of pregnancy, he murdered her and burned her in his backyard. When he left, <clears throat> when he fled, the Marines called a press conference and they said, today, we lost two good Marines. They lost a murderer and a good Marine. Today, I dedicate my commitment to this bill to Maria Lauterbach. Thank you. Now we'll hear from our co-lead in the Senate, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Thank you, Jackie. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is such an important day because we are together announcing support for a piece of legislation that would transform the entire military justice system in a way that allows for justice for survivors of sexual assault and all, all other serious crimes. This leadership you see in front of us today, with Jackie Spear at the helm, who's been at the forefront of this issue for a decade, is so profound. To have Republican leadership, uh, starting with Mike Turner and our other colleagues, is extremely important. And if you look at our, their other colleagues, they're service members, and they'll talk about their service. They'll talk about what it's like uh, with Congressman Brown to be a JAG, what it's like to dedicate over 20 years in the armed services. These are men and women who have served, who as members of Congress, recognize their dual responsibility of one, understanding the importance of the role of the commander, but most importantly, understanding their role as a member of Congress. As Jackie said, Congress wrote the military justice. We wrote the entire structure of how military justice is to be handled. 
So we are responsible for oversight and accountability over the executive branch and specifically the armed services. And Jackie and I are now chairwomen of the personnel subcommittee. So when we are looking at how do we protect the men and women in the armed services so they can do their jobs, this bill is necessary. This is a bill I've been working on in the Senate for a long time. I started working on this eight years ago with Senator Grassley. This year, Senator Joni Ernst has also joined us. She is the only female Republican command, com former commander in the Senate. She is not only a former commander, she's a sexual assault survivor. So it is important that you understand how the coalition of people standing here today is so important because this is the kind of leadership that Congress is responsible for. We are supposed to be bringing bipartisan support and solutions for the greatest problems we are facing. And there is no, bit, <clears throat> no greater problem in the U.S. military right now than the scourge of sexual assault. We have over 20,000 sexual assaults estimated each year in the U.S. military. Despite 10 years of effort to change the law with almost 250 different laws changed to improve how we deal with sexual assault in the military, that scourge continues to get worse. And even worse than that is the view of the commanders. The fact that our generals, our admirals, our service secretaries are still against this reform is shocking. We've had every Secretary of Defense since Dick Cheney saying, we've got this, ma'am, we've got this. We have zero tolerance for sexual assault. Today is the first time that we have a Secretary of Defense who agrees that sexual assault should be taken out of the chain of command. That's a big deal. Because it's a recognition that the chain of command is not inviolate. It is not the most important thing. What's the most important thing is that men and women of the armed services has a criminal justice system that is worthy of the sacrifice they make every day in serving our country. That is our responsibility. And so this bill is, very, is designed very specifically to meet that goal. We have a bright line at all serious crimes. And that is an important bright line. We want to make sure that whether you're a plaintiff or a defendant, that you have access to a military justice system worthy of your sacrifice. For survivors of sexual assault, it's absolutely necessary. We have asked for more cases to go forward. We have asked for more commanders to take this seriously, and they have not. If you look at the evidence and statistics over the last decade, the percentage of cases that are going to trial is not going up, it's going down. The percentage of cases ending in conviction is not going up, it's going down. The number of people who are retaliated against because they report this crime is stubbornly at about 60%, unchanged. So when the commanders say, we got this, man, we got this, they don't have it and they aren't even prosecuting retaliation. We had to make, Jackie, I, and the others standing here, we had to make retaliation a crime in the NDAA three years in a row, because they just wouldn't prosecute it. In the last year, guess how many cases have been prosecuted? Guess. One, it's disgraceful. So, we need this bill more than, now more than ever. And there's a second reason why this bright line is so important and it's defendants' rights. And it has to apply to all felonies because if you are going to jail for more than a year of your life, you deserve a review by someone who's actually trained, a trained military prosecutor. You deserve a review by someone who has no bias against you. Well, if you are a black or brown service member, I'm sorry to say there it may well be biases against you because in the statistics out of the DOD itself, in some of the services, you are up to 2.61 times more likely to be punished because you are a black service member. So this bill is written specifically to create a bright line at all serious crimes to protect both plaintiffs and defendants, to deal with two grave injustices that we have evidence. Jackie has had a hearing on the racial disparities. We have evidence from the DOD and the unbelievable scourge and unwillingness of the command to prosecute sexual assault and to take these crimes seriously. Now, I think the fact that both Jackie and Mike mentioned cases 
where victims were murdered is really important. Because if you only eliminate and only take out one crime, then those cases of murder would not be investigated by a trained military prosecutor and reviewed by them. And that is so important. So that is why our bill is importantly and carefully drawn. We take out military-specific crimes, like going AWOL, and we let the commanders address those uniquely. But this bill is meant to solve the problem of injustice in the military justice system. And for the family of Vanessa Guillen, who has stood up and demanded this justice from Congress, we are answering you today. We stand with you. We are Vanessa Guillen, and we will not give up until this reform is done. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, next, uh, Congressman Brown will speak, um, former JAG, as a matter of fact. First, let me thank uh, Representative Speer and Senator Gillibrand for their leadership and advocacy, decades' worth of work on this important issue. I'd also like to thank my colleagues from both sides of the aisle uh, coming together today in support of the most significant reform of the Uniform Code of Military Justice since 1968, when Congress then created the modern military trial judiciary. In 1968, we took our responsibility and our authority to look at the Uniform Code of Military Justice and say, it can be better. We can professionalize the judiciary by taking it away from lay officers and lay commanders and putting it with trained lawyers who will be trained in judicial proceedings. That's what this Congress did in 1968. And what we're doing today is just as significant. Our military justice system, it is a great system, but it's not the best that it can be. Our service members who defend our country, our values, our way of life, for their service and sacrifices, we have to commit ourselves as a Congress and a nation to give them the very best. But what's been clear for a long time is that our military justice system is much less than the best. It fails our women and men in uniform, particularly black and brown enlisted soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and guardians. In a military where 43% of our service members are black and brown, black service members are more than twice as likely to be referred to court martial for the same offense committed by a white service member. In a military where only two of the most senior four-star admirals and generals are black, year after year we see data showing racial disparities in disciplinary actions and punishment against black and brown service members. This is across every service of our military it's systemic, and it demands both our attention and action. I served as an Army judge advocate. I saw this system's flaws firsthand. Commanders aren't lawyers. We knew that in 1968. We're acknowledging it today. Their focus is and should be on combat and combat support operations. To be certain, they need the tools to maintain good order and discipline, and we give them those tools. But they don't need the responsibility to make decisions regarding complex criminal cases. Commanders, in this sense, are failing our troops, but only because we're asking them to assume a responsibility that they're ill-equipped to perform. We see that on full display in our military justice system when it isn't pursuing justice on behalf of victims of sexual assault. The current system, where commanders are asked to decide which cases to prosecute and which cases not to prosecute, has led to a breakdown of trust in our military justice system. Women are fearful to report their assaulters, and black and brown service members are fearful of prosecutorial misconduct by commanders. That lack of trust erodes unit morale and cohesion, as well as a trust in command. 
Regardless of the high esteem in which we hold the military, and we certainly do, the military justice system reflects the racial biases that we see in our broader criminal justice system. I served in the military for 30 years. I love this institution, and that's why I'm standing here today with my colleagues to improve our armed services and our military justice system. It's time for a comprehensive military justice reform. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Representative Miller Meeks. Thank you. I want to thank my colleagues here today for partnering with me on this important issue. I'd also like to thank Senators Ernst, Grassley, and Gillibrand for leading the charge in the Senate to protect our service members and hold their perpetrators accountable for their horrendous actions. And I would especially like to thank the family of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen for joining us and for their tireless advocacy and courage. As a 24-year Army veteran, I know the importance of unit cohesion, but as a doctor and a woman, I know the trauma that too many of our service members have endured. When we choose to serve our nation's armed services, that honorable and voluntary choice does not also voluntarily waive our right to due process. What happened to Vanessa and has happened to so many others is tragic, and it's incumbent upon us to keep our service members safe and get them the justice they deserve. We are here today to introduce the Vanessa Guillen Military Justice Improvement and Increasing Prevention Act. This bicameral and bipartisan legislation will professionalize how the military prosecutes serious crimes by moving the decision to prosecute these crimes in the military from the chain of command to independent, trained, and professional military prosecutors while keeping the military chain of command informed. Our legislation will improve prevention programs, training, and education, improve how we hold perpetrators accountable, and give prosecutors the training they need to better handle sexual assault and domestic violence cases, but also while keeping the chain of command informed. Too often, our military justice system has protected the service rather than the service member. By failing service member victims, the broken process weakens unit cohesion, harms recruitment and retention, and ultimately, the military strength of our nation. Given our all-voluntary military, our strength is only as resilient as our individual members, and the time to act is now. Thank you. Thank you. Now um, we'll hear from my former co-lead on the Military Personnel Subcommittee, uh, Congressman Trent Kelly. And a general, I might add. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Speer. You know, I want to start out and say that I've served over 35 years in this nation's military, and I've actually conducted UCMJ at all levels, up through brigade and higher. I've also been a district attorney. I'm probably one of the few people standing up here who have prosecuted a sexual assault case, who have seen the difficulty and the hard work. I understand the legal, and I'm not a JAG in the military. I was an actual uh, combat soldier. This is so important, what we are doing here today. And there will be some people who fight against it. And I wouldn't be for it if it wasn't the right thing, narrowly tailored to accomplish actual results that are going to make the lives of our service members, specifically women who are being sexually assaulted, better. Thank you guys for doing this. This is the right thing to do, and it's going to have a genuine impact on recruiting and retention, on, on, on making sure that uh, we don't have commanders doing something they're not trying to do. Very few men and women who serve in the military in any capacity are not dedicated to this nation and are not trying to do the right things. However, I would not ask a lawyer with no military training to conduct combat operations. And we should not ask our commanders at whatever level with no legal training to try felonies and sexual assaults, which they do not have the capability to do. It's not because they're not good people. It's they don't have the training and tools. Chairwoman Spear and I have worked for several years, four years, on getting this right. 
I have been opposed to many things that she has asked for because I thought they were overreaching and overbroad. Senator Gillibrand, what a wonderful job you have done in having the right tool to fix the right problem. Thank you for what you've done. Specialist Ginn, I was at Fort Hood immediately following also. This is the right thing to do, and it's right to recognize her. I'm sorry that we're recognizing her instead of her standing up here with us being part of this. But at least we're moving forward, and we're doing something that will work. And with that, thank you. Uh, now we will hear from uh, Congresswoman Veronica Escobar, a member of the Military Personnel Subcommittee and Armed Services Committee. Good morning. And I first want to say to Myra and Lupe, thank you for being here. Really appreciate that you have been with us every step of the way. Y para su mamá, por favor, dele uh, um, nuestro pésame otra vez de nuevo. Y estamos tan agradecidos por el trabajo que toda la familia ha hecho. I'd like to thank two incredible women who are leading the way for us on this issue, this long overdue solution to a monumental failure by the military. And that is my chairwoman, Jackie Spear, and Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, who have brought forward a collaboration between the Senate and the House, between Republicans and Democrats, to finally address that monumental failure. I represent the community of El Paso, Texas, and in El Paso, uh, I have the incredible privilege of representing Fort Bliss. And in my short time in Congress, I have spoken to innumerable women who have also dealt with, lived with, suffered from the trauma of sexual assault. And in fact, one young woman, private first class Asia Graham, who died a year after her rape, a death probably that was linked to her trauma and to everything that she dealt with, came to Fort Bliss with high hopes, with dreams of a long career in front of her, and with dedication to her country, much like Vanessa Guillen did. And what she found, unfortunately, was terror and trauma and an attack. It turns out her rapist, who was sentenced last week and uh, who was actually found guilty last week, it turns out he was a repeat offender. And he was a repeat offender because he had not been brought to justice before. And as we peel away the information that we've learned about her offender and about his victims, some of his victims were too afraid to come forward. And I have heard over and over again about the fear of retaliation, about how women are discouraged from actually following through on reporting attacks well, think of his career, they've heard. Well, think about the consequences for both of you, they've heard. Failure after failure after failure is what we've seen in this system of non-justice. Either we are a country of justice for all or we're not. Either we believe that victims deserve due process or we do not. The time has come to finally address this, to recognize the monumental failure, and to recognize that doing the same thing over and over again will not change things. We have to reform the system. I am so proud to have worked with amazing leaders to bring this legislation to the point where we are on the precipice of passing it. And I look forward to the work ahead. Thank you. Uh, now we will hear from uh, Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia, who is the uh, member representing the Guillen family in Texas. Thank you. Um, I have here Madam Speaker, but she's gone. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Spear and, and Senator, for all your hard work. It's always been uh, great to know 
uh, that you're there and have been there for so, so many years. And to all our members that are here, uh, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for joining us in this effort because, uh, as was said earlier, this is not just about Vanessa Guillen. She was the catalyst. She's the one who highlighted and put it on the front page of the paper, not just here in our country, but all over the world. But it's about all soldiers feeling safe on a military base. We must continue to work hard to ensure that they're safe, uh, that their families are safe, and that when they do have a complaint, that they are heard, that they get due process, and that the justice system works for them. I can tell you that as a, um, a lawyer and a former judge, it really just never made sense to me that there was a separate system for uh, the military personnel. It just never did. I remember, I almost remember, I know we have several lawyers here in the room, uh, when we talked about that in law school, it just didn't make sense. It made sense that there be some body to handle any misconduct issues, much like employers handle misconduct in their workplace, because this is the workplace. Uh, so it never made sense. So I can't believe uh, that so many years ago as a, as a law student, I'm finally seeing some change. And to Myra and to uh, Lupe, Thank you for being here to represent the family. Myra, I still remember last May when we first talked, and I told you that we would continue to fight every day until we got justice for Vanessa. Here we are a year later, and we're so close. And as Speaker Pelosi said earlier uh, in this press conference, we will get it done in the House. We will get it done soon. And with the votes that the senator has already gathered in the Senate, I feel confident in saying uh, that we will get it done in the Senate. And I know that President Biden will sign it. So thank you for all your work. I, I'm sorry that your mother and father are not here to witness here today, but I'm sure that somebody there is live streaming and they can watch the reruns later. But please tell them that we will continue the fight. And for me, it will always be about Vanessa in making sure that we get justice for Vanessa Guillen. Thank you, and I yield back. It's now my great honor to uh, welcome two extraordinary young women who have um, given voice to so many who have been victims of sexual assault in the military. They are the sisters of Vanessa Guillen, both Maya and Lupi Guillen. And to your parents, Roger and Gloria, uh, Please know that they continue to be in our prayers and thoughts, and um, we will not stop. So, please. Does that work? <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lupe Guillen. I'm Vanessa's youngest sister. First and foremost, I want to thank everyone present that's here today. Thank you, Congresswoman Spear, Congresswoman Garcia, Congresswoman Escobar, members of Congress, and Senator Gilbert. Sexual violence is so common in the military, that's why it's now considered a pervasive problem in the armed forces that tolerates other inappropriate behaviors like sexual harassment, assault, rape, and domestic violence. There's no law, so instead it protects the aggressors and allows leadership to throw sexual violence under the rug. Normalizing retaliation, resulting in 64% of the women who reported a sexual assault face retaliations. Reasons why Vanessa Guillen was afraid to report it. But eventually, yet again, the command did nothing about it. Someone had to suffer in order for all of us to realize what's happening. And that someone was Vanessa Guillen. Someone will always have to suffer for someone to care, but that stops now and it stops with us because that's why we are here today. Because no matter how much developing or funding the SHARP program receives, it's ineffective. That's why law must be established and that law is the Vanessa Guillen Military Improvement and Increasing Prevention Act. Like I always ask when I stand up in the microphone, when are we going to start protecting the victims, not the victimizers? Because apparently 76.1 of the victims did not report the crime in 2018. 
due to the status of reporting it to the chain of command. The same command that it's either the aggressor or friends with the aggressor. The same command that was harassing my sister for almost a year. The system that we have now fails my sister, especially as Vanessa Guillen. So it's up to us to change that. Not only her, for countless of others resulting into numbers out of three out of four, three out of four women that arrive at Fort Hood ages 18 to 24 were sexually harassed or assaulted. One of those women was my sister. Lastly, I want to thank Senator Gilbrand for being in this fight with us, Spears, for fighting and fighting, never giving up, and for committing into making the soldiers and their families whole. That's why we must be the voice of the voiceless, be the help to the helpless, and be the change by creating it. This is not a race issue, not a gender issue, not a political issue, whether you're a Democrat or Republican. It's a human issue. Because before soldiers, before the title of private first class, before the title of being a specialist or a general, there are humans too, just like everyone here in the room. So when we say liberty and justice for all, that includes justice for Vanessa Guillen and justice for those victims. That's why we must pass the Vanessa Guillen Military Improvement and Increasing Prevention Act. Hello, um, I wanna thank everyone that's here today personally. Um, from the bottom of my heart and my families, this means a lot to us to be standing here today um, next to, you know, all these powerful leaders that lend, lend their hand to us. And without them, this wouldn't have been possible. And I personally want to thank Senator Gillibrand for, you know, committing with us to, to get these uh, to get this bill passed as one. Um, I totally believe that this brings not only justice for those sexual assault and harassment survivors, but to all of those um, military members that suffered countless criminal acts, which, you know, it's so hard to believe. And um, I want to thank Senator Gillibrand for committing to us that she will make sure that the claims process is included in this year's NDAA. It's a part of the bill that we had established um, and we want to bring it together to make sure that it's done because it will bring our soldiers and their families, um, we need and deserve to be indemnified. So I hope this brings, um, I know this will change a lot of people's lives, um, starting with ours because it's been a long year of fighting and no sleep and, you know, it's, it's so hard to, to put words together. Sometimes I speak, I'm speechless as to how we all came together and we were able to unite and bring this, brought, this bill. And um, thank you. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Attorney Nellie Guam. Um, I want to thank everyone today. I especially want to thank Congresswoman Jackie Spear. Um, again, she's just hit this out of the park. Uh, I want to thank Senator Gillibrand. You know, this marriage between these strong, powerful women. Uh, I was honored when I heard that we were going to do this together. And I believe that this will be done, and it'll be done quickly, Fast enough so that way if I get another phone call, someone's going to ask me, has the bill been passed yet? I'm looking forward to saying yes, it has been passed. Um, this is just an incredible day. And uh, last year this time when I took on this case and uh, the DOD and the Army and the generals told me that, that there was no sexual harassment, Vanessa never was sexually harassed. Just because someone says that someone wasn't sexually harassed, she wasn't alive to tell them they're lying. Today we're proud to say the DOD and the Army admitted she was sexually harassed. I want to tell all those victims out there, just because someone doesn't believe you doesn't mean you're lying. It just means you just got to keep fighting for justice like we fought for J Vanessa. And thank you so much, Congressman Garcia, for being behind this, Escobar for being behind this, Kelly, all these congressmen, congresswomen, senators, thank you so much today. Thank you so much today for making my clients, the Guillen family, believe in America and believe in how great this country is. Thank you. All right, other questions? Yes. I would first say that we are delighted to see 
that Secretary of Defense Austin um, has followed through on his commitment with the 90-day review and come up with the conclusions that he has. Uh, we strongly support the President who has been committed to taking um, all of these cases out of the chain of command. And again, I will just point out that it is the Uniform Code of Military Justice is a creation of Congress. Congress has the right and the responsibility to amend it as it sees fit. And we are taking the action we are today because, in our opinion, um, it needs to go beyond sexual assault and sexual harassment and include all military felonies um, that are all non-military felonies that um, should not really be handled by a commander, but by professional staff. Senator Gillibrand will respond. Yeah. Um, well, I agree with uh, Congressman Speer. Um, it's historic that we have the first Secretary of Defense ever to agree with us, all of us here today, that sexual assault should be taken out of the chain of command. That is a huge, monumental step forward to recognize that good order and discipline does not rest on a commander deciding whether a case goes forward. Good order and discipline rests on the commander doing their job, instilling a culture of of respect between service members and instilling a command climate. We know from the Fort Hood report that the command climate at Fort Hood was so toxic that it was permissible for sexual assault and permissible for sexual harassment. Commanders are responsible for keeping good order and discipline and a productive command climate regardless of whether or not they have this one decision-making authority. And for clarity, 97% of commanders have to maintain good order and discipline and never have convening authority for general court marshals. Only 3%, level 06 and above, have the authority to do this. So having the Secretary of Defense decide that he no longer needs convening authority for serious crimes such as sexual assault is what we've been saying for a long time. So that is validation that our approach is the right approach. Second, the reason why we draw the bright line at all serious crimes is because we need a military justice system that's fair, one where the person making the decision is highly trained, highly specialized, and know what they're doing, and have no bias. And so making that bright line at all serious crimes assures that for all serious cases, that it's decided by the most professionalized system and the most unbiased system that we, as members of Congress, can create. Last, the commission was only asked to look at one crime. They were only asked to tell us, how do we solve this problem of sexual assault in the military? They came up with recommendations that are very important and profound and one that I certainly support fully. They have drilled down on the issue of sexual assault and sexual harassment. They've drilled down on issues such as domestic violence and child abuse. And they agree that all of those crimes must be taken out of the chain of command and given to trained military specialized prosecutors. They're also going to make a series of recommendations that we will be able to debate and discuss in the weeks and months to come that are excellent and that will continue to professionalize the system and make it even stronger. But General Austin's support is extremely favorable and helpful in our cause because he is telling everyone, including the president, that maintaining good order and discipline, maintaining command control does not require convening authority. And that is our point. Commanders have to do this job no matter what. We believe that these serious crimes, the decision about whether to move forward, should be made by the most qualified, most unbiased person. So we are moving forward, and today is a success day for every person standing here today. Let me say that uh, Secretary Austin uh, is a decent man um, and an outstanding Secretary of Defense from day one. Uh, he came uh, into this organization, the Department of Defense, to make it a better place for all soldiers. He ordered a stand down to address extremism. He had a commission, independent, 
to look at the issue of sexual assault. He is moving in the right direction. An overwhelming majority of the Senate, and you will see an overwhelming majority of the House, believe that we need to accelerate that movement, to expand the list of offenses that are no longer referred to court martial by commanders, because what we are doing in this bill is addressing bias in the system, bias when it comes to a woman who is um, uh, raising an issue of sexual assault, the bias that sort of tends to think, no, it, it, it couldn't have been that bad. It, perhaps it didn't happen. Or as you've heard from others, do you know what you're going to do to your career and the career of, uh, of that man? And bias that weighs against black and brown soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. Commanders have too many com competing interests and obligations to effectively and fairly administer the Uniform Code of Military Justice. This bill, like I, and I said, in 1968, we did a similar uh, um, reform measure. We put it in the hands of professionals, attorneys who are trained in these matters, and who we can hold accountable for one thing and one thing alone, fair treatment under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. That's what we're doing today. I would also just like to point out that um, this happens to men and women in the military. 60% are women, but 40% are men. Yes, next question. Yes. I would say that that uh, response is very typical of what we have experienced for the last 10 years, a, an unwillingness um, to move forward. And while I'm grateful that they finally recognize that sexual assault and sexual harassment cases need to be taken out of the chain of command, uh, with this bill we're saying we want to go further and take all non-military felony crimes out of the chain of command because we're very concerned and rightfully so that there is a bias that exists and as Congressman Brown had mentioned earlier that you have black and brown soldiers who are more likely to be charged, um, twice as likely to be charged as white uh, military service members. So um, it is significant that they've come as far as they have. Uh, the fact that they haven't come as far as we would like um, is just an opportunity for them to become more enlightened. Couldn't say that any better. Um, but I would also draw your attention to the fact that these are reforms that our allies have already made um, and made them over the last 40 years. And Israel, UK, Germany, Netherlands, Australia, and Canada have all done a bright line at all serious crimes, removed them from the chain of command, and given them to trained prosecutors for the purpose of creating a better, fairer um, system, and specifically for defendants' rights. Um, if you look at the UK, they did it over a murder trial where the accused did not believe he could get a fair trial, and their uh, country and their legal system agreed, and so they created the right line. This is the right solution. Uh, the service members and the service secretaries have been fighting us from the beginning for the last 10 years. They don't want to do anything. So if I was to put it in military terms, they have retreated to just sexual assault. 